Good morning, everybody. I'd like to invite everyone to please take a seat. We have a jam-packed day today. I'd like to... And good morning. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I am delighted to welcome everybody here, uh, including all of those watching online and those who are following the conversation on Twitter, uh, which is hashtag USA Vietnam. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us today for a very important conversation. And I'm especially pleased to welcome our very distinguished guest, Senator Patrick Leahy. Thank you for joining us. Deputy Minister of Defense, Senior Lieutenant General Weechi Ving. Uh, Vietnam's current ambassador to the United States, uh, Ha Kim Yuk, uh, as well as former ambassador to the US, uh, Pham Wong Ving. Uh, we're Pleased to have you here, and also happy to have with us uh, from the U.S. Uh, side, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia, Joe Felter, and Deputy USAID Administrator Bonnie Glick, who will be joining us a little bit later. I also want to give a warm welcome uh, to Bobby Mueller, Fred Downs, and Ann Mills Griffiths, uh, three Americans uh, whose lives and careers have been deeply intertwined with the war in Vietnam and whose contribution to reconciliation and the welfare of veterans are indelible. So welcome to everyone. Um, it's fitting that the U.S. Institute of Peace was asked by the U.S. and the Vietnamese governments and by Senator Leahy um, to host this event. USIP itself was founded by members of Congress uh, who were veterans of World War II and the Korean War, and seared by their battlefield experiences, they determined that it was critical for the U.S. to have greater capacity to understand how to wage peace as effectively as we wage war. And so in 1984, Congress established U.S. Institute of Peace as an independent, nonpartisan national institute dedicated to preventing and resolving violent conflict. And so we link research with policy options, with training, and work in partnership with people, organizations, and governments around the world so they can prevent and resolve violent conflict and hold events like this uh, for the opportunity to have additional reflection and discussion for joint learning. So a lot has been written about the conflict in Vietnam, which was a war that saw the loss of more than two and a half million Vietnamese and more than 58,000 American lives. Uh, more than 2,600 Americans and many thousands of Vietnamese soldiers went missing or were otherwise accounted for. What is not generally known and what is not fully appreciated, however, is the important story of how these bitter enemies managed to overcome deep suspicion and lingering hostility to turn enmity into cooperation, cooperation into partnership, and ultimately partnership into peace. That journey from war to peace is what we've gathered here today to discuss and to learn from. Uh, and to help us with that conversation, we are very fortunate to have a, a distinguished group of experts and speakers, most of whom were deeply involved with the war or its aftermath. Um, after today's session, everybody is invited to join us for lunch in the Great Hall, just out here. Um, and with that, uh, Allow me to introduce our first speaker for the morning, uh, Vietnam's Deputy Minister of Defense, Senior Lieutenant General Hui Chi Ving, a native of Hue province. Uh, General Ving has a long record of service to his country. He began his career as a soldier in 1976, and he rose through the ranks uh, to hold his current post of Deputy Minister of Defense, a position he's held since 2009, which means he has spanned several American secretaries and deputy uh, secretaries of defense during that past decade. And by the way, General Ving's father was also a very distinguished soldier, uh, Win Chi Tang, who was a well-known general in the Vietnam People's Army and a former politician. And today, those of you who have visited Hanoi will see a major boulevard in his name. Please join me in welcoming General Hui Ching Ving to the stage.
Madame Lancy Lindbergh, President of the USIP. Honorable uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by expressing our thanks to the USIP, Madam President, and uh, I uh, would like to thank Mr. Patrick Leahy, Senator, for presence here and USA in Vietnam, who are all uh, have joint efforts to put together this very meaningful activity. I'd also like to thank you all for your presence here, especially the U.S. veterans who have made contributions to the strong expansion of Vietnam-U.S. relations. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, war has been a thing of the past, and our two countries have been working together for the past 40 years to overcome war legacies. In that 40 years, lots have been done with difficulties and even uh, sometimes we feel it's too hard, but with the efforts of the two governments and the noble feelings, the values of humanity of both Vietnamese and Americans, we have risen above challenges and difficulties. And as you see, the result that we have achieved is worthy of pride, and the world could look at it as a model or a sample of two countries, the Expo Force, coming together. Now we can feel at peace that though uh, unexploited ordinances are still in Vietnam, but Vietnamese children no longer die because of it. Ten years ago, it was something hard to believe. If we can look at the uh, families of uh, American war veterans missing in Vietnam, they have welcomed their children home, those who have not. But it is my belief that we will see the day when their children were coming back home with their families, their beloved ones. That's something that is so valuable. They have died for 40 years, 50 years, but their children, grandchildren will live happily, becoming a better person. Or in Vietnam, we may see that the disaster of Agent Orange, chemicals, because different types of or chemicals, different stages of the war, because of different uh, reasons, not just dioxin. But we can see that the Bien Hoa project is an example of the Vietnam US cooperation. Such cooperation represents the uh, political relationship, the uh, advances of technology, the contribution of both sides to peace, to environment, to the world. That is a highlight of the world. It's not just Vietnam US in contributing to the uh, environment protection and to the Millennium Goals. We have another uh, record project, the Bien Hoa one. We will work together on that. We've been preparing hard so that by the end of April, when the uh, U.S. Uh, Senator Lei He leading a delegation to Vietnam, I will have the honor with Mr. Leahy to launch the Bien Hoa project. After eight years, we launched the similar activity in Da Nang. That launching with the joint government's efforts and uh, those of the people, 40 hectare, the golden land in Da Nang, now become a land of development, become an airport where we uh, welcomed President Donald Trump to Vietnam for the APEC summit in 2017. We told the president that the place that we're sitting here was the one that uh, Ms. Leahy and I launched, the uh, inauguration of the Da Nang Airport uh, Remediation Project. People there were living in fear, in bad shape, but now, they have the peace of mind to have a better life. 
that is so precious and that would bring about trust to the Vietnamese people, to the American people, their trust to their government and to their uh, partner country. Nothing is better than uh, developing a relation by overcoming the legacies of the past. Mr. Bob Miller told me just momentarily ago that the efforts of the U.S. in Vietnam have brought about happiness to the people, including the special persons like Mr. Patrick Leahy, uh, the war veterans, those who supported the Vietnam-U.S. relations, those embarked upon that road, no matter uh, small or big efforts, and I think we all own them. Words of gratitude is not only about bringing about happiness to the people, but it's also about raising trust of the two governments and forging the relationship. It is so good that we have today. The most difficult part of the past now becomes the best part for cooperation for the future. For the Vietnamese people, the Vietnamese people are gratitude to those uh, who have brought resources from the Vietnamese government and also from the American government in such a flagship project like Da Nang or the Bien Hoa project such assistance to the people. It's not just about the material or resources, not just the uh, dollar and cent, but the gratitude to the friendship, to the compassion that the Americans, the Vietnamese, have been working together to lessen the pains of the war. The Vietnamese people, they are willing to go to the sea, to the mountains, to help the joint uh, searching forces to account for the American missings. The Vietnamese people never denied such a support for accounting for the remaining of American pilots who died. Again, I thank Senator Patrick Leahy, a simple a noble heart coming to us with no condition, only the wish that the MIA families of the Americans, the families affected by dioxin, by uh, unexploded ordinances in Vietnam, will have a better life. So I think we should talk more about the future because that's a time when we were tested through various activities of overcoming war legacies and we'll have the confidence that we need to have a attitude of peace, cooperation and shared development and, and mutual trust. With that, I uh, would conclude and I'd like to thank uh, Madam President and I think thank you all for your presence and I hope that our seminar will be a highlight and represent a contribution to Vietnam-US relations in the uh, war legacy overcoming efforts. Thank you, General Lin. We look forward to hearing more from you uh, on the panel a little later on this morning. Um, my name is Bill Taylor. I'm the Executive Vice President here at the United States Institute of Peace. Um, I spent a year and a half in Vietnam decades ago, and so I've been looking forward to, to this discussion uh, with, with great interest. Uh, the next part of our uh, session today um, is a video produced uh, by the government of Vietnam, um, and it depicts the ongoing joint efforts that uh, General Vinh has, has referenced. I would like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, delighted that uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia, Dr. Joseph Felter, can join us this morning. 
Dr. Felter is uh, uh, representing the Defense Department, uh, and as a former Army Special Forces officer and Foreign Affairs officer, Foreign Area officer, he served in a variety of diplomatic and other uh, other other operations. Uh, Dr. Felter, uh, please join me and please welcome Dr. Felter to the. Well, thank you, President Lindborg and Senior Lieutenant General Ving for putting this amazing and important event together. I think it's especially fitting that it's hosted here at the U.S. Institute for Peace, uh, given the mission of the Institute and the occasion that we're celebrating. Uh, it is quite an honor to be invited to speak here today and represent the U.S. Defense Department on such an auspicious occasion. I'm truly humbled to be in the company of the many dedicated people here who have led the way in overcoming the painful legacies of war promoting reciprocal humanitarian steps towards reconciliation and normalizing relations between our two great countries. There's so many illuminators here who've done so much for this cause. Um, I'd like to especially recognize a few of them. Uh, Senator Leahy, of course, uh, his vision for resolving war legacy issues and promoting healing between our countries have truly been instrumental in blazing the path towards the defense relationship we have today. I know our department works closely with Senator Leahy and his staff. I see Tim Reeser here on so many other important issues, uh, and, and we appreciate his leadership. I will be joined later today by our former Secretary of Defense and Senator uh, Chuck Hagel, uh, our former boss at the Pentagon, um, and we look forward to, to, to his attendance. Uh, a veteran of the war himself, uh, he ensured a focus on the past to create a bright future for the partnership. Uh, former uh, ambassador to Vietnam, uh, Dave Shear, I saw him on the way in. Uh, he presided over our first dioxin re remediation project at Da Nang, and his tireless advocacy has been critical to building the relationship and, and cooperation. I see the previous and current ambassadors to the United States from Vietnam, Ambassador Ving and Ambassador Noc, uh, personal friends and, and great friends of the United States. Thank you for all you have done and continue to do to build uh, this relationship, ambassadors, and thank you for being here. Uh, I also saw uh, Ms. Ann Mills Griffith of the National League of POW MI Families. Uh, Ann served in leadership roles in the league for 40 years, so we know she must have been in elementary school when she started. Uh, uh, significantly, Ann's brother, Lieutenant Commander James Mills, who you saw in the film, went down to Vietnam in, in 1966 in his F 4 Phantom. Uh, James was finally brought home in August of last year, providing Ann's family the closure that the league, under her leadership, help bring to so many others. And thank you, thank you and your brother for your service and sacrifice. On behalf of our department, uh, thank you all uh, and the many other illuminators for what you have done to help our countries overcome our difficult past and build the ever-expanding cooperative partnership we enjoy today. A half century ago, to many Americans, uh, Vietnam was not a country, it, it was a war. Uh, my own father was an army officer uh, with extended service in Vietnam, and I was raised an Army brat, uh, growing up on military bases and attending uh, Defense Department schools during those difficult years. Young children of deployed service members' hearts would stop when a solemn principal would come into their classroom and escort a student out uh, to go down to the office to meet a grieving parent. Uh, these same kids, while out playing in the neighborhood on these Army posts uh, across the country, would wait in, in fear when, when a staff car would roll into the neighborhood, hoping that an officer and chaplain in crisp dress green uniform would not get out and knock on their door. I can only imagine what so many children and families were going through in Vietnam at this time as well. If you were to describe to anyone during those dark times where U.S.-Vietnam defense relations would be today, no one on either side would have believed it, and yet here we are. In the last two years alone, the United States and Vietnam marked several historic milestones in defense relations, including the first aircraft carrier visit to Vietnam since the end of the Vietnam War, the first transfer of a major piece of defense equipment, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter, the deployment of Vietnamese peacekeeping uh, a unit to South Sudan with the support of the United States and other like-minded partners, and an unprecedented level of senior engagement including two visits by President Trump and two by then Secretary of Defense James Mattis to Vietnam in just the past two years. In short, U.S.-Vietnam defense relations are at a high water mark and represent one of the strongest pillars in our multi multifaceted bilateral relationship. While the progress we have made is remarkable, 
None of it would have been possible without the strong foundation of bilateral cooperation built through our efforts to account for American missing from the Vietnam War. This incremental cooperation paved the way for reciprocal humanitarian efforts by the U.S. government and non-government organizations to address other legacies of war, especially addressing the suffering of disabled Vietnamese citizens with the help of non-government organizations, disposing of unexploded ordnance, and cleaning up dioxin contamination. As former Secretary Mattis would often say, all wars end. For the past several decades, dedicated people have worked hard to resolve these issues in a way that addresses the humanitarian concerns of both sides and builds cooperative partnership for the future. The long process of crossing Vietnam's self-described bridge to normalization began when President Reagan came into office with a known commitment to the returned prisoner of war and resolved to account for those still missing, a mission which remains critical to the department and is being led by the steadfast efforts of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency under the leadership of now Director Kelly McKee. Uh, Kelly is here today. Thank you for all you and your team continue to do for the cause, Kelly. Active efforts commenced nearly 40 years ago when then Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Richard Armitage and a small delegation traveled to Hanoi in 1982 to discuss cooperation on accounting for those missing Americans. Through the tireless efforts of people like Rich Armitage, Richard Childress of the National Security Council, Ann Mills Griffith of the National League of POW MI Families, and other defense and state department officials in the Reagan administration, the United States made incremental but significant progress over the next decade to obtain answers for the families and count for the missing U.S. personnel. Because of their dedication and the cooperation of forward-looking Vietnamese leaders like then Foreign Minister Nguyen Co Tak, we began the process to bring our people home with honor, recognize their sacrifices, and bring answers to their families, a process that continues to expand with strong, ever-increasing support and cooperation from the government of Vietnam and the Vietnamese people. At the same time, our two sides built patterns of cooperation and mutual trust that ultimately led to the normalization of relations in 1995 and the establishment of formal comprehensive partnership in 2013. Since the start of cooperation on accounting for the missing, the United States has also made great strides by lifting legislative restrictions and working to address the legacies of war that so tragically affected Vietnamese civilians and impeded Vietnam's development. In 1993, the State Department and U.S. Agency for International Development began a program to locate and dispose of unexploded ordnance. Since then, and with the backing of Senator Leahy and others, the United States contributed more than $119 million for clearance operations, risk education, victims assistance, and capacity building for a national mine action program. The United States has also been proactive in addressing soil contaminated by dioxin, which we all know is a hazardous byproduct of Agent Orange. In 2016, the United States began a project to clean up contaminated soil at Da Nang Airport, a process that successfully concluded late last year. Also in 2016, President Obama committed to partnering with Vietnam to clean up a larger dioxin hotspot at Benoit Air Base outside Ho Chi Minh City. President Trump reaffirmed this commitment when he visited Vietnam in late 2017. I am pleased to say that the U.S. Agency for International Development, in partnership with Vietnam and with support from the Department of Defense, will break ground on this project next month. I had the distinct honor of visiting this site at Benoit with then Secretary of Defense James Mattis last October where we saw firsthand the immense scale of this project and were impressed and moved by the close cooperation between our technical experts. Moving forward on this project was very important to Secretary Mattis, who saw it as a critically important step in the long process to finally exercise the ghosts of our past and free our people's hearts and minds to focus on achieving a positive and cooperative future together. Thank you to the American and Vietnamese patriots mentioned here and the legions of others who worked so hard to make this project and so many others possible. The decades of close cooperation on legacy of war issues and accounting for the missing have paved the way for the United States and Vietnam not only to grow our defense relations, but also to cooperate ever more closely in promoting regional and global security. We consider Vietnam one of our most important partners as we work together to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific, a region where all nations, large and small, can prosper side by side in freedom, peace, and stability. By free, we mean that nations will be free from coercion and able to protect their sovereignty. 
By open, we mean that all nations can enjoy freedom of the seas and airways, and that all share a commitment to the peaceful resolution of disputes. Our shared vision for the Indo-Pacific excludes no nation. We seek to partner with all nations that respect national sovereignty, fair and reciprocal trade, and the rule of law. Our aim is for all nations to live in prosperity, security, and liberty. To be clear, we do not ask countries to choose between the United States and any other power. We do encourage states to choose to invest in the capabilities needed to defend their own sovereignty and to work with partners who share a similar vision for the reason future and to work to achieve it together. We are committed to building partnerships with like-minded countries like Vietnam who share our commitment to global principles and norms. Our objectives for our relationship with Vietnam, they're quite simple. We want a strong, prosperous, and independent Vietnam that can work with us, ASEAN, and like-minded nations such as Japan, Australia, and India to contribute to both regional and global security. We will continue to enhance our comprehensive partnership with Vietnam in the years ahead by focusing on practical defense cooperation, especially in areas such as maritime security, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, peacekeeping operations, and search and rescue operations. We are committed to assisting Vietnam build its military capabilities in the areas. We have great respect for Vietnam's demonstrated commitment to uphold the rules-based order and welcome its increasing leadership role in promoting regional and global security. I might mention that we look very much forward to ASEAN's uh, 2020 uh, ASEAN share. Uh, General Vinh, we look forward to working with you on that. So the United States and Vietnam have made extraordinary progress over the last several decades in overcoming our past differences and building a positive and cooperative relationship and partnership that benefits our peoples as well as the broader Indo-Pacific region. But how did this happen? Um, I'll conclude with a brief attempt at, at, at an explanation. I spent some time in academia before, after the military and before coming to DOD, uh, to taught international relations at, at West Point, uh, Columbia, and more recently at Stanford. In class, I dutifully explained to my students uh, international relations theory that predicted that states would cooperate if they had shared interests, um, that they were, they were bound to cooperate um, in this dangerous uh, anarchical international system. So academic theory, I think, can, some, can to some degree explain why states cooperate. And I've highlighted this morning that the US and Vietnam have many common interests and a genuine shared vision for a free and open region where all states support and are protected by a rules-based order. But I don't think these academic theories tell the whole story. I don't think they really hold up outside the ivory tower. Shared interests are a necessary but not sufficient condition for states to cooperate and work together to achieve these interests. Cooperation at the level we see between the United States and Vietnam takes extraordinary people, dedicated individuals working tirelessly to harness the potential created by our common interests. Building trust and relationships are critical. They are the connective tissue that really makes cooperation possible. Uh, you know, I'm looking at Ambassador Ving. I, I know that uh, if you join in for dinner and, and, and toast the U.S.-Vietnam relationship over scotch, you can't help but feel good about the U.S.-Vietnam relationship and walk away <laughs> changed with, with, inter, with national interests held constant. It's, it's that personal connection and that personal commitment to build this relationship that, that, that people like Ambassador Ving and so many others have, have helped contribute to. Um, the burgeoning U.S.-Vietnam relationship we enjoy today would not have been possible without the solid foundation of cooperation that was built by many in this room who worked diligently to address the painful legacy of war and promote humanitarian cooperation. Because of your tireless efforts, we have honored the sacrifices of the fallen, improved the lives of future generations, and built a strong partnership between our countries that is increasingly a pillar of stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region and an example to the world. Thank you for the opportunity to join you here today. Thank you, Dr. Felter, for those remarks. Um, and I am now very delighted to welcome our next speaker, Senator Patrick Leahy, the longest serving Democrat in the Senate. Uh, Senator Leahy from Vermont has been at the forefront of addressing some of our most critical foreign policy issues for a long time. And with his leadership on the Judiciary and Appropriations Committees, he has been a force for advancing peace and human rights and he brings conviction, heart, and courage to these critical issues that he champions. He was instrumental in establishing programs to assist victims of landmines and to support humanitarian demining. And very importantly, he played a key role in pushing for the international treaty to ban anti-personnel mines. 
Um, Senator Leahy, we are grateful for your leadership on so many causes essential for peace, uh, for being a hero to so many of us. Please join me in welcoming Senator Leahy. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate that. And thank you to the U.S. Institute of Peace for housing this very unique event. Thanks to all of you being here, especially those who came all the way from Vietnam. I, along with two disabled American veterans of the war in Vietnam, had the opportunity to meet with uh, Senior Lieutenant General Ving earlier this morning. As Nancy and General Ving said, he and I have worked together for many years on Agent Orange, and I have great respect and friendship for you, General. Back when we started, I didn't think any, any of us I would be here today. I expect that Ambassador Nock, probably everybody in this room, feels the same way. Many of us know people who served in the war on both sides. Some lost their lives. The names of the Americans are etched in the black granite wall, just a uh, few hundred meters from this building. Others were grievously wounded. Words cannot adequately describe the magnitude of the catastrophe that war was for the people of both countries. Forty-four years later, we still struggle in this country with the remnants of the divisions in our society caused by the war, as do the people of Vietnam. My involvement with post-war Vietnam began in 1989, when former President George H.W. Bush and I talked about the need for reconciliation with Vietnam something that many Americans, including veterans of the war like Bobby Mueller and John Kerry and John McCain were calling for. In fact, my friend President George H.W. Bush agreed to use what was later named the Leahy War Victims Fund because of organizations like the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, led by Bobby Mueller, that provided prosthetics and wheelchairs to Vietnamese who were severely disabled from landmines and other unexploded bombs. And I praised President Bush for doing that, and I praise him today. That assistance, which continues today, has enabled thousands of Vietnamese to regain their mobility and their dignity. Of course, as we saw in the video, others had been working on the MIA issue even earlier. Their heroic work helped bring closure to hundreds of American families. It was made possible thanks to the invaluable help of the government of Vietnam at a time when the United States had an economic embargo against Vietnam as it was struggling to recover from the war's devastation. For many years, the United States has also been helping to locate and destroy the millions of landmines and other unexploded bombs that continue to maim and kill innocent Vietnamese. Fortunately, thanks to that work, the number of casualties is far fewer today than it used to be. 
but more remains to be done. And over the years, I've had many conversations with officials of the government of Vietnam before and after, before and after diplomatic relations were reestablished in 1995. No matter what the subject of those conversations was, the Vietnamese always brought up Agent Orange and its effect on their people. At the same time, American veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam and were suffering from cancers and other illnesses were also lobbying for help from their government in the United States. In 1991, the Department of Veterans Affairs recognized these claims, but it wasn't until another 15 years had passed that we finally began to address this issue in Vietnam. As Senior Lieutenant General Bing described, we started at Da Nang. This is not in my script, but General, I will never forget driving out in your car to the spot where we started the eradication of the Agent Orange, and I thank you for that. And the U.S. Agency for International Development deserves great credit for undertaking and completing such a complex, difficult, but ultimately successful project. The Vietnamese Ministry of Defense, and especially General Ving, worked closely with USAID. In doing so, the Ministry of Defense and USAID not only overcame many obstacles to complete the project, they also helped to advance relations between our two countries to a higher level. Like the MIA and UXO issues before it, Agent Orange evolved from a subject of anger and resentment to one of cooperation and appreciation. For four decades, the Da Nang Airport was a health hazard to tens of thousands of people living in its vicinity. But a little over a year ago, Air Force One landed there for the APEC summit meeting. Soon after, the USS Carl Vinson docked at Da Nang, and sailors from that aircraft carrier visited an orphanage for children who may have inherited their disabilities from parents or grandparents who were exposed to Agent Orange. Look how far we've come. None of that would have happened were it not for the perseverance of USAID and the U.S. Embassy and their Vietnamese counterparts. Ambassador Nock previously is Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and today has been a strong supporter of this. And Ambassador, I thank you. Throughout this period, USAID has also expanded its health and disability program to seven Vietnamese provinces. They provide medical, rehabilitation, infrastructure, and social assistance to severely disabled Vietnamese in areas that were heavily sprayed with Agent Orange or contaminated with dioxin. In less than one month, I am going to lead a delegation of 10 senators Democrats and Republicans to Vietnam. It'll be my fourth trip there, and this time we will travel to the Binh Hoa Air Base near Ho Chi Minh City, which was the largest U.S. military base in Vietnam during the war. Senior Lieutenant General Ving and I, U.S. Ambassador Daniel Crittenbrink, USAID Mission Director Michael Green, and other Vietnamese officials will inaugurate the Dioxin Remediation Project at Benoit, the largest remaining hotspot of contamination in Vietnam. This will be a far larger project than Da Nang. It will be one of the largest environmental remediation projects in the world. And at the same time, 
I and my Senate colleagues will witness the signing of a memorandum of intent between the United States and Vietnam spelling out a new five-year commitment to support health and disabilities programs for persons with disabilities in provinces that were highly sprayed with Agent Orange. Now, these achievements be, were be possible because of those first efforts by the government of Vietnam to help locate American MIAs and by the U.S. government to assist persons with disabilities in Vietnam. But we should also recognize the indispensable role of U.S. veterans of that war and non-governmental organizations. They, on their own initiative, years before the U.S. government was ready or willing, traveled to Vietnam and began the process of building bridges between our two countries. And the benefits of the humanitarian co cooperation have been so far reaching. It has reunited the remains of U.S. soldiers with their loved ones. It has enabled many people in Vietnam who lost their mobility to become mobile again. It has helped Vietnamese families and communities to care for the disabled. We are getting rid of the dioxin, and we have begun to help the government of Vietnam identify the remains of Vietnamese MIAs. Just as important, this cooperation has been the foundation of a growing relationship, partnership. While our two governments have strong disagreements on some important issues, we share many interests, from increasing academic, professional, and cultural exchanges to expanding trade relations to combating climate change. Our partnership with the Ministry of Defense the active support and engagement of the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of State in these humanitarian efforts have opened up new opportunities for cooperation on regional issues. So let me conclude. We cannot escape the fact the war was a disaster for generations of Vietnamese and Americans. Each of us who have lived through that period have our own memories our own emotions, our own opinions. For me, there can be no excusing the folly of that war, nor diminishing the immense destruction and suffering that it caused. But we can all be proud of the way our two countries have worked to overcome that tragic legacy. And there's so many in this room who have contributed to that effort. We come a long way. We have further to go, and we'll go there together. Thank you. <laughs> now, this is this is how Nancy. She does it better than I do. But uh, I would like now to invite Ambassador Charles Ray to moderate today's first panel on foundations of the U.S.-Vietnamese post-war partnership. In 1998, Ambassador Ray became the first U.S. Consul General of Ho Chi Minh City. He later served as our Ambassador of Cambodia, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for POW Missing Personnel Affairs, most recently as Ambassador of Zimbabwe. I don't know where you find the time, but please welcome <laughs> Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Leahy. Um, you know, anytime anyone introduces me like that, I really think I should be lying on a slab with, with flowers on my chest. Uh, it's more like a eulogy than an, than an introduction. Uh, it, I'd like to ask the other members of uh, Panel 1 to please come up. Um, Ambassador Pham Quang Quang Vin. Uh, Director Kelly McKeag, Senior Colonel Nguyen Hu Luong, Mr. Robert Destat, 
uh, and Mr. Fred Downs. If you would please come up and take your, your seats. Do you have any order up here you want to send? Um, doesn't really matter. You guys fight over it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would add a little levity by letting them fight over, play musical chairs. <laughs> no. As previous speakers have said, uh, this forum uh, is a unique opportunity to bring together American and Vietnamese experts who've been intimately involved in important humanitarian efforts uh, and in laying the groundwork for our bilateral relation. Uh, and that's especially so uh, for this panel which brings together subject matter experts of two of the earliest efforts of the U.S. and Vietnam to move forward from the aftermath of war. One is the POW-MIA accounting issue, uh, and the second is assistance to Vietnamese, those affected by dioxins uh, and those uh, prosthetics for those who were victims of unexploded ordnance. Uh, my own involvement with Vietnam dates back many decades as well, uh, beginning with two assignments there as a young captain in the Army in 1968, 69, 1972, 1973. Uh, my assignment as the first American Consul General in Ho Chi Minh City uh, in 1998 to 2001, uh, and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Prisoners of War Missing Personnel Affairs at the Department of Defense uh, from 1996, uh, from 2006 <laughs> to 2009. Uh, the members of this panel uh, include Ambassador Pham Quang Vin, the former Vietnamese ambassador to the United States, Mr. Kelly McKeague, the current director of the Defense Prisoner of War Missing Persons Accounting Agency, uh, the successor to the Defense Prisoner of War Missing Personnel Office that I had the honor to lead from 2006 to 2009. Senior Colonel Nguyen Hu Luong of the Vietnamese Office for the Search for Missing Persons of the Vietnamese Ministry of Defense. Mr. Robert Destat, Vietnam Analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency. And Mr. Fred Downs, former National Director of the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, Prosthetic and Sensory Aid Service. Each of these gentlemen brings to this forum decades of knowledge about experience and involvement in this issue. Their detailed bios are included in the package that you've been given, so I won't go into a, a lot of that. Uh, what, I, what we hope to gain from this panel is how, from a situation of bitterness and hostility as former enemies, the United States and Vietnam have demonstrated that former enemies can, in fact, put the past behind them to build a peaceful, productive, and mutually beneficial future. The focus of this panel is to illuminate how you, these humanitarian efforts I've mentioned contributed to the strategic and vibrant U.S.-Vietnam relationship we have today. In the interest of keeping to what is a full and very important schedule today, uh, rather than have each of the panelists make introductory remarks, I will ask each of them in turn an initial question, uh, beginning with Ambassador Vin. Uh, and during their response, I would hope that they can provide you with the background of their involvement in these important issues. Uh, then, time permitting, I will ask further questions of each panelist. I would ask that each keep their responses to about three minutes to enable us to get through this. Uh, this discussion will continue for about 20 minutes, at which time we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, we'll do that for a further 20 minutes. I would ask that each audience member asking a question, please identify yourself, your affiliation, and keep your questions short and to the point so that everyone possible in the audience gets a chance to ask a question. 
And so, without further ado, I'd like to go directly into the Q&A. Uh, Ambassador Vin, from a diplomatic perspective, how important was the POW-MI accounting issue to building trust and confidence between the United States and Vietnam? Uh, uh, happened to be that uh, my first trip abroad was to the United States back in 1983 to the UN General Assembly in New York. And I have served two terms in New York at a mission during the 1980s and 1990s, and very lastly from 2014 and in the middle of 2018 as uh, Vietnam ambassador to the US. So, uh, from, for, as a diplomat, I've been uh, watching part of the stories of how we work on the MIA issue uh, in particular and on uh, our normalization and development of relationship in general. Uh, point number one is we have a joint humanitarian mission. The human ties that we observe, especially through the video clips here, show us that the people involved have compassion for each other. They know that we have a, a tragic war. There are lots of wounds and losses in Vietnam and in the US. So this is time that we join together on a humanitarian mission. Point number two, I observe that there are ordinary but brave men and uh, outstanding leader who have been working to uh, to take the stewardship in, in, in the bridging of the gaps between our two nations who have been at war together. So uh, you have been mentioning uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, Senator John McCain, Senator uh, John Kerry, we have Bobby Miller here and many other Fred Downs. And, and actually we admire them, but at the same time, even before we have uh, normalized ourselves in our relationship, uh, still with the, the embargoes, that, but the efforts on MIA issue has been started. Point number three I want to raise here is that the enduring efforts and commitment in doing this issue as part of our common cause for the uh, families of, of, of those who have been uh, suffering from the war. Uh, so through that, we understand more each other and we've been uh, we are building uh, trust with each other. And that overall has been uh, contributing uh, effectively and significantly to the development of our relationship. And more than that, the understanding of the peoples. I take the uh, advantage of being here to uh, express our appreciation uh, to the Viet vets who have been uh, vanguarding in in, in uh, bridging the gaps, even at the very early stage. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Our next, uh, Director McKeague, uh, why was the POWMI accounting mission so important to the building of a U.S.-Vietnam relationship? And do you think this model is transferable to other countries or situations? I've had the privilege of serving the MIA accounting mission for four and a half years first beginning in 2012 as uh, Air Force officer, and then since uh, 2017 here in this present position. In this time, I have witnessed remarkable progress to both the pace and scope of operations and the overarching bilateral relationship. One cannot discuss the MIA accounting mission in the larger context of the U.S.-Vietnam strategic relationship without the mention and kudos to the National League of POW MIA families, and in particular, its chairman, Ann Mills Griffiths. The League and Ann, in cooperation and coordination with the Reagan administration, took the first cautious, yet very tangible policy initiative to use the fullest possible accounting for missing U.S. persons from the war as an opportunity to pursue a dialogue with Vietnam. This led not only to the three decades of joint sustained operations and cooperation on the MIA mission, but it laid a foundation for trust and cooperation that was the bridge to normalization and diplomatic relations. Simply put, the humanitarian nature of the POW 
MIA Accounting Policy Initiative and Mission, as pointed out by Ambassador Ving, engendered trust and goodwill, and it allayed Vietnamese concerns that perhaps America had ulterior motives to the mission. Both sides put away and aside the animosity of the war, and fellow warriors took the appropriate first steps of putting the past behind them. A little known fact, the U.S. had established its MIA office in Hanoi several years before the U.S. Embassy. It was a unique diplomatic engagement, but it's indicative of the creativity and cooperation each side brought to the accounting mission. From its humble beginnings, the POW MIA mission this very day has 139 DPAA personnel operating in Vietnam, the largest number ever. And together with its Vietnamese counterparts, they are conducting seven excavations and three investigations in five provinces. As for using the Vietnam model as a template for other countries or situations, yes, pursuing the humanitarian endeavor to account for our fallen personnel is widely recognized as a non-threatening means of building trust and confidence. And as it has been shown in Vietnam, the remarkable cooperation and efforts by both countries clearly demonstrate this mission can pave the way for better understanding, normalization, a strong friendship, and in the process, contribute to peace, security, stability, and prosperity. Thank you. Uh, Senior Colonel Luong, could you tell us, please, your perspectives as a Vietnamese dealing with the United States on this issue in the aftermath of, of war? Uh, what was that like for you? Honorable Ray, and uh, listening to this guest about perspective of Vietnam, we always uh, consider the uh, accounting for MIA as a humanitarian mission, and we do not have any political conditions from the beginning. And right after the uh, Paris Agreement signed to finish the war in Vietnam, the government of Vietnam established the Vietnam SMP, and uh, we unilaterally uh, uh, conducted the uh, accounting missions to hand over to the United States without any conditions. Meanwhile, we have a lot of difficulties and challenges uh, with many people move in poverty and the hatred of uh, Vietnamese people and the worrisome of the, the Vietnamese families who have their loved ones lost in the world. But we still carry out the MA missions. And in 15 years from 1975 to 1988, we unilaterally conducted uh, and handed over 302 sets of uh, remains to the U.S. And after that, we also uh, uh, response to the requirement of the U.S. to let delegations to investigate the uh, American MIA cases in Vietnam. And from 1991 to 1993, the special committee of the U.S. Senate uh, on MIA cases confirmed that there's no POW cases in Vietnam, and after that, the uh, joint missions uh, have been conducted. And so far as uh, General uh, Mark Kirk uh, mentioned that we have uh, been uh, doing the 134 joint missions, and uh, this time we are doing the 134th mission with uh, seven uh, excavation sites and more than 139. DPAA personnel, and we also have the about four, 700 Vietnamese people joining in that mission. And on site, we uh, recognize and find out uh, several uh, bones and artifacts. And we plan to have the uh, uh, repatriation ceremony on the 2nd of April after uh, more than three months of the mission. And uh, to Vietnam, even for the uh, very difficult uh, MIA cases that we, uh, the U.S. did not have the conditions to approach, like uh, the high mountains, we also conduct the, uh, our unilateral missions. And, and there are uh, several very typical uh, cases, like in Quantum, more than 2,400 meters. But we also uh, did the unilateral missions and fired out the two MIA 
uh, says it remains and closed that case. And other cases, like in Quang Ninh uh, uh, Sea area or the Quang Bing Mountain area, very difficult to run. But uh, we also uh, conduct the unilateral missions, and basically we have been able to find out the remains of the uh, U.S. soldiers. About the MIA cooperation, we have the common assessment that we have a very positive uh, uh, contribution to the overall relations between the two countries. Uh, it's not only about the uh, uh, labor material, but also you know the lives of the experts of both sides, like the uh, helicopter crash in Quang Bing in uh, 2001. Nine uh, military uh, and uh, diplomatic uh, staff of uh, Vietnam and seven, seven military, U.S. military died in that case. So they are sacrificed to the humanitarian missions and efforts for the reconciliation of the two countries are great, and we are appreciate. And the U.S. Congress and the American people, as well as the Vietnamese people, uh, acknowledge that MIA cooperation is uh, the model of cooperation for the two countries, which contribute not only for the uh, cooperation between the two countries, but also the U.S. and other countries' relations. And uh, that's what I'd like to share to you. Thank you. Câu hỏi tiếp theo là cho ông Fred Dawes. Ông đã tham gia vào các cái hoạt động tạo mưa từ những ngày đầu. Thì ngài có thể mô tả cho các khán giả ở đây Military veterans and ordinary citizens were key in the early days to accounting for our missing Americans. I can't recall a single instance in which we have accounted for a missing American where we were not led to the recovery site by a Vietnamese veteran or ordinary citizen of Vietnam. Our records can tell us where a missing soldier or Marine died in battle but only Vietnamese veterans of that battle can tell us if and where they buried the remains of that missing soldier or Marine. Our records can tell us where an air a pilot crashed in North Vietnam. Vietnamese records can tell us the name of the unit that shot that pilot down and the name of the village nearest to the crash site, but only veterans of that military unit or ordinary citizens of that village can lead us to the recovery site. And to give you an example, an AC-47 aircraft gunship with a crew of six disappeared over Laos on a combat mission on the December 24, 1965. Our searches of the last, in the area of the last known location and along the plane's flight path were not successful. Nearly 30 years later, in 1994, a retired Vietnamese senior colonel named Cao Dang Nin telephoned Colonel Luong's predecessor, Senior Colonel Chun Bian, and reported that he had information about a crash site in Laos, and he wished to bring it to the attention of the American MIA office in Hanoi. Colonel Bian brought Colonel Nin to my office Colonel Lean showed me his wartime diary. In that diary, he had transcribed the names and serial numbers from the ID cards that his men had found on the bodies of six crew members, that they, deceased crew members that they had retrieved from the wreckage of that aircraft. Colonel Lean described where the, his men had buried the remains near the crash site. But most importantly, 30 years earlier, Colonel Nin had, had, or had written in his diary the map coordinates for that crash site. His diary revealed that that aircraft had crashed 120 kilometers north of the last recorded location in our records. Without Colonel Nin's, and Colonel Nin was the only person in the entire world who knew of the existence of that record of his diary and the information he had recorded in that diary 30 years earlier. Without his assistance, we may never have located that wreckage and we may never have recovered the remains of those six Americans who now rest very near here in Arlington Cemetery. And this is just one of many, many examples of how Vietnamese veterans and ordinary citizens of Vietnam 
are helping the United States to account for our countrymen who became missing in Vietnam during the war. Thank you. Mr. Fred Downs, can you describe for us what you discovered about Vietnamese amputees and the country's rehabilitation facilities during your first trips to Vietnam? Yes, <clears throat> yes, we, um, when they first uh, put the team together, I was a subject matter expert for prosthetics. I've been uh, responsible for thousands of uh, veterans here in America for the amputee, uh, their amputees and uh, taking care of making sure they had prosthetic limbs. So in going to Vietnam, the question was, well, were the Vietnamese really serious about this, this gesture on their part or not? So my responsibility was to listen to what they had to say, then tour the rehab centers, uh, talk to some veterans over there and find out what was going on. Frankly, there was a lot of mistrust. Our side uh, didn't know whether they were really gonna do it or not. <clears throat> and uh, I was in the position of being, a, of course, a soldier but who had been wounded over there and lost his arm. So it was kind of a going back and forth as I thought about how am I going to deal with this Vietnamese who was sitting across the table from me and uh, quickly learned that we had a lot in common. And then I began to meet some of the soldiers uh, who had been wounded in the war. And we developed a rapport because I was a soldier and he was a soldier and we were doing our jobs. And so I quickly looked at it from the point of view as an amputee, I needed my arm. So when I looked at him and saw that his leg or his arm was gone, I knew he needed that prosthetic device. And so I began to make that transition from thinking of them as, the, as a distant enemy, instead thinking of them as a, as a fellow soldier. And what could I do to help them? And so from that, I began to develop a program. And certainly when I went to the rehab centers, they didn't have the equipment, they didn't have uh, materials, they were lacking in steel and metal and plastics. And so one of the things that General Vesey had told us to do, he said, Fred, tell us the truth when you come back. If they really need something, we want to know it. If they don't, let us know that too. So certainly wrote down, they needed everything. They needed training. They needed more prosthetists. They had thousands of amputees and they didn't have the equipment and the materials to, to take care of all of them. So yes, it was a very, when we came back, it was the kind of thing where yes, indeed, we need to supply equipment, materials, supplies, everything else we can to the Vietnamese to help them in their rehab centers. And from that, we then began to develop a program so that we could live up to our end of the deal, get that equipment and material to them. The first three or four trips, it was, a, you know, felt more and more, got wider and wider. The element of trust got tighter and tighter. And I remember uh, one of the old soldiers I met uh, had part of his jaw was missing and he was a leg amputee and he'd been wounded over 12 times during the course of the war. He'd fought against the uh, French and the Americans. And so we were sitting there in the rehab center talking back and forth through our interpreter and uh, we both agreed that we were glad the war was over and it'd be better off if we could just buy a beer instead of fighting each other. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, back to you, Ambassador Vin. Uh, and this is a this is a bit of a blue sky question here. Uh, could you please give us your view on the future of these two missions, the POWMI accounting mission and the humanitarian assistance to Vietnam? Uh, but in addition, uh, sort of your uh, prediction on the future of U.S. Vietnam relations. Thank you very much. Certainly, I would love that the uh, missions on both sides, uh, the uh, MIA issues and also the helping of Vietnam's overcoming the war legacies, including uh, toxic uh, redemigration, uh, helping the people uh, affected by the war and also uh, the uh, future project of, of Bien Hoa would be going on very well. The Vietnamese government, I know, very committed to work totally and fully with the U.S. side on the MIA issue. And we are encouraged that we have good signs on uh, more support and more assistance from the U.S. to, uh, to help Vietnam. 
uh, in the different areas of overcoming the wars. So working together, building trust, and helping each other will be uh, a cornerstone in our uh, normalization and relations. But at the same time, I, I see, uh, especially during my time here last three years, uh, we see a lot of common interests uh, in our bilateral relations and also in uh, the relations beyond uh, our bilateral ties, that is our regional and global cooperation. And very much hope that uh, our current uh, comprehensive partnership will be, will be further deepened. And I very much look forward to a further exchange of uh, high-level visits. There has been an invitation by President Trump last time when he was in Vietnam uh, to invite the Secretary General of the party and uh, President of Vietnam to be here this year. And I think Ambassador Ngoc will have a, a full year uh, with heavy shock. Uh, with a lot of exchange of visits. But I think that uh, we have many other areas about political, apart from political relationship. Uh, trade and economic will be very much important. Uh, science and education will also be another one. Defense and security, but I wish to mention more on uh, people-to-people people -to -people exchange. This should continue to be more and more we have the ties of the peoples over the past year, especially in overcoming the world legacies. We have the ties now of the people in working together, helping each other to develop and to better uh, preserve the region and the world in peace and prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Director McKeag, uh, your second question. How does our current relationship facilitate achieving the fullest possible accounting uh, and what's our current strategy for, for, for doing this? We've made a tremendous level of cooperation and progress with our Vietnamese partners. In our current strategy, the Vietnam War accounting is DPA's highest operational priority. While we've made great strides toward achieving the fullest possible accounting, we cannot rest on our laurels. There's still much to do. And with witnesses aging and dying, as, as was pointed out earlier, soil acidity and Vietnam's development, time is our greatest enemy. But I'm confident that the relationship we have forged, the bonds we have formed, will lead to even better initiatives, greater progress, and increased results, such that the fullest possible accounting can be achieved in Vietnam in the coming years. You heard Cur Senior Colonel Luong talk about the unilateral efforts of the Vietnam, Vietnamese government and people. That's an extraordinary development that's occurred over the last few years. There are two Vietnamese recovery teams that go about doing this work. There is one unilateral team. Last September, they went to an inaccessible island that took two and a half hours to get to, two and a half hours to walk to on the side of a mountain, and this Vietnamese unilateral team was able to recover the remains of Lieutenant Richard Lanham. Thank you very much. Uh, Senior Colonel Luong, uh, what is your view on the future of the Vietnamese-U.S. cooperation in the accounting mission? Ladies and gentlemen, As for the steps forward in the cooperation between our two countries in the MIA efforts, I think there are a lot of advantages. But of course, we have challenges in terms of uh, the advantages. It is our policy that will continue to provide support to the U.S. side for the full, uh, fullest possible accounting of the uh, MIA. Secondly, the support of the Vietnamese people, they always have unconditional support for this effort, and they will help us in this effort. And thirdly, the cooperation from the uh, Vietnam DPAA has been working with the U.S. counterpart for 30 years. We have uh, over 200 days working together 
at different localities in Vietnam. We have established campsite in the mountainous area. We uh, shared uh, the good days and bad days. We give uh, advantages to the other and uh, take difficulties to ours. As uh, Chiron Marquis said, the sites are uh, becoming more and more difficult. They're in remote and uh, areas so, uh, in the sea. Uh, the witness are aging. The weather, the uh, conditions are changing. The remainings are also eroded. So we have to uh, accelerate uh, the efforts. Those are the challenges. At present, Vietnam have uh, the uh, necessary technologies to uh, conduct a survey at sea. We mobilized uh, technical equipment and ships and uh, technicians and our divers who could dive for uh, 40 or 50 meters deep into the sea to support the uh, American site for uh, investigation at the seabed. And we are also ready to uh, enhance our unilateral efforts at the mountainous areas while its two sites uh, may not work together. We will mobilize the uh, on-the-spot forces, the military, the police, the people. We may uh, conduct uh, unilateral uh, search. We are thankful to uh, the American side have, who have supported us in uh, dealing with the world legacies, especially the uh, veteran organizations who provided information to us, the artifacts. We have accounted uh, for over 1,000 uh, missing Vietnamese soldiers. Now, we still have 200,000 Vietnamese missing soldiers still, not yet accounted for. We hope that the American uh, veterans organizations, organizations, uh, persons, individuals, if we can have a organization to collect all the information so that we can continue to uh, account for Vietnamese missing soldiers. And the two sides will uh, pool resources. We may organize or mobilize more uh, human resources for the uh, American MIEs, as uh, you say. As you see in the uh, cliffs, one, over 1,000 MIAs of America are still there, and we have, we have to race against the time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Destat, you are familiar with a number of people on both sides uh, of the accounting mission from the early days. Do any of these people stand out in your mind as having made a particularly significant contribution to the mission or uh, to building a constructive bilateral relationship between our two countries? Well, uh, during those early days, many of the people involved in the accounting mission, both on the Vietnamese and the American side, were veterans of the war. And I think our shared wartime experiences made it easier for us to communicate, relate to each other. Uh, I think that was a significant uh, issue. But I would begin by mentioning uh, Mr. William Bell and Mr. Ho Xuan Dick, they w led the earliest joint field operations in the late 1980s. Mr. Bell became the, the uh, chief of the first uh, USMIA office that opened in July of 1991 in Hanoi. And that was, as uh, uh, Mr. McKeague uh, mentioned, was the first official U.S. representation in Vietnam after the war. Mr. Dick was the first director of the Vietnam MIA agency. And during those very difficult first days of our joint work, uh, they laid the groundwork for the cooperation and goodwill that came after. Uh, I would also have to mention uh, General Thomas Needham. He was the first commander of the joint task force that uh, uh, took uh, the uh, major responsibility for the accounting mission on the American side in uh, January 1992. And Colonel Jack, Jack Donovan, who became the first commander of the 
Joint Task Force Office in Hanoi. Uh, these two officers expanded our operations in Vietnam exponentially, and they put in place mechanisms that ensured that future operations would run efficiently and effectively. And they led the way on the American side in establishing that uh, constructive relationship and goodwill that continues to exist today. Uh, my boss at, here in Washington, D.C., Charles Trowbridge, uh, his support and patient guidance uh, were indispensable to me. Uh, t Lieutenant Colonel Paul Mather. Paul began working on the joint mission with the four-party joint military commission in 1973. He took part in the earliest negotiations and returns of missing Americans in the 1970s. Uh, Mr. Nguyen uh, Xuan uh, Phong, Mr. Nguyen Chi Kong, uh, Vũ Chi Kong, um, yeah, Vũ Chi Kong, uh, and Mr. Uh, Nguyen Ba Hung. Uh, these three gentlemen were among the first directors of the Vietnam MIA agency, and they led the way on the Vietnamese side in establishing those common understandings and goodwill that exist today. Um, there are many others. Uh, I would mention... Uh, Mr. Pham, uh, Pham Zung from the Ministry of Interior, uh, Colonels Nguyen Ngoc Bic and Lee Ki from the Ministry of Defense. On the U.S. side, uh, Marine Officer Tony Banks, uh, Army veterans uh, Gary Seedow and Steve Thompson, uh, Air Force veteran Ronald Ward, uh, Mr. James Coyle. Uh, these and so many other specialists, uh, Vietnamese and Americans, contributed greatly to our early efforts. But I would reserve special mention for Senior Colonel Chun Bien, Chun, Senior Lieutenant Chun Bien, and uh, Colonel Pham Tao. Uh, right. Uh, and uh, these gentlemen spent enormous amounts of time in the field, far away from their families, to assist and guide our field teams. Colonel Dale worked with our special teams and led many of the joint teams in the field work. Uh, Colonel Bien was the first deputy director of the Vietnam MIA uh, uh, agency representing the Ministry of Defense. Uh, Colonel Bien and his uh, staff of military officers were key to the successful joint field operations, records research, and excavation work that was done in those early years. Uh, unfortunately, Colonel Pham Dale suffered a massive stroke while in the field with one of our joint teams in 1997. Uh, he has since passed away. Colonel Bien, he was among the 16 Americans and Vietnamese officers who lost their lives in a helicopter crash while on a POW MIA mission in 2001. Uh, these were very fine gentlemen who made very significant efforts to our joint efforts, and it was an honor to work with them. Uh, and I'm, all of the officers that I've mentioned, uh, they stand out in my mind because they demonstrated not only their government's commitment, but their personal commitment to doing everything reasonable to help the United States resolve the MIA issue on a humanitarian basis as quickly as possible and without linkage to other issues. And as I said, it was an honor to have the opportunity to work with these gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, my final question to the panel before we open it to the audience Q&A. Uh, Mr. Downs, you've written a number of Outlook articles in the Washington Post about your trips to Vietnam. Could, could you briefly Tell us, what has the reaction to your articles been from American veterans and from the American public? Yes, well, I uh, wrote the, for the Outlook section of the uh, Washington Post, and it was uh, after discussing with General Vesey, we needed to let people know what we were doing, what was the use of the humanitarian teams, how was it going to affect the MIA, and um, teams that were also working or wanted to work, and so I wrote the article, and what I basically said was the war is over, 
and it's time that we need to begin thinking about working together. And I listed all the different humanitarian areas in, in prosthetics, wheelchairs, prosthetic limbs, uh, and braces, and the people I had met in the rehab centers. And so when I wrote that article and then it was published, <laughs> ooh, it was like a bomb went off. Um, because there were a lot of Vietnam vets who were still very angry and uh, very much against uh, any relationship with Vietnam. There were, uh, they, they had, uh, the P, they were all wrapped up in the POW MIA issue. Uh, they didn't believe a thing that the Vietnamese were going to tell us. They thought that uh, we were being led astray. And, uh, but on the other hand, that was a small group of Vietnam vets. A larger group of Vietnam vets, they came forward and said, yeah, Fred, you're right. It's time that we get over this. It's time for us to go forward. And so, yes, we do support the humanitarian effort. We support what you're trying to do, what you and the teams are trying to do. And so that was a, a big relief. Uh, I, caught, uh, I caught a lot of flack from a, a couple of key people for quite a long time. In fact, still one person still doesn't like me because of that uh, stance. But uh, this, is a episode, this is a time in which you gotta stand up and, and you gotta say to people, okay, I've changed my mind on how I think. And here's what I now think, and it's the right way to go. Humanitarianism is a universal kind of thing. We're not only talking about men, we we're talking about women, we we're talking about children. There are people I saw in the rehab centers, they needed this help. And we as Americans who were greatly involved in that war, we could do it. You know, I felt that, I felt that myself, uh, I had left, I put blood in the soil of Vietnam. I felt like I had a part of it. It's a part of me. And so whatever I can do to help Vietnam move forward, I was very passionate about doing that. And uh, I still feel very strong about it to this day. Thank you. Okay, now, now we're going to open it to the audience uh, for Q&A. Um, once again, I'd, I'd like to ask that, that each of you, if you would please state your name and affiliation and keep your question brief so that as many people as possible get to ask questions. I'm going to let the monitors there pick people because uh, you're probably going to get upset with me if I cut you off. I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Uh, I'm Jim Paris. I work in the uh, USAID's Asia Bureau here in Washington. And I just would like to hear Ambassador Ving and, and maybe Fred expand on his what he was just talking about in terms of the role of the organizations that weren't really connected to the war effort or post-war effort. I know John McAuliffe is here. The U.S. Indochina Reconciliation Project did a great uh, contribution and others. But I'd, I'd like to hear Ambassador Ving sort of reflect on those that don't, were working on the road to reconciliation how were they mixed and working with the effort to overcome more legacies? How maybe they were clashing or any other reflections you may have? Uh, and same for Fred, thank you. Well, we wrote that report about our first trip and we made a presentation to a large group of NGOs. And uh, the, the purpose of that was first, uh, NGOs wondered what, what are you trying to do here, America, State Department, Department of Defense? And what we were trying to do is tell them, even though uh, America has restricted you for years from uh, being involved with Vietnam, uh, we now are going to open the door and say, you can now apply for going into Vietnam and, and assisting the, the Vietnamese. There was a lot of distrust at first, of course, that we really believe, that they, they, did we really mean that? And, uh, but there were some groups that were already in there uh, I think World Vision, I think uh, the Quakers are a couple of them who uh, that I can recall. And so those groups, um, they, they continue to be advocating for more involvement in Vietnam. Is that the, the question you were asking? Yeah, they, they, they were always supportive because they, they uh, wanted to be involved with Vietnam anyway. And, and once America started lowering the restrictions, enable them to apply and then uh, go ahead and be free to go into Vietnam and use their money and resources to help uh, build up these humanitarian areas. If I may add that, um, 
In the early days of uh, our two countries' relations, especially after the war, I think the, uh, the people and the organizations have been coming to Vietnam first for uh, contacts and for assistance. I remember uh, when I was first posted in New York back in the 1980s, I know John McAuliffe is over there. He's working hard on reconciliation. But for nowadays, many American NGOs and organizations have been working still in Vietnam on uh, different areas, uh, on humanitarian areas, certainly uh, uh, landmark clearing, or uh, the peace trees, the rules of peace, and many other organizations. But also there are other uh, organizations are working in helping the people, especially the people in the rural area and mountainous areas to overcome uh, poverty, hunger, and others. And many others also bringing technology and, and uh, skills of, of uh, an education to the people. So many American NGOs together with other uh, foreign NGOs are working in Vietnam. We have Ambassador Ngoc, who used to be the chairman of our National Committee on uh, foreign NGOs, and he knows very specifically how much effective the NGOs have been working in Vietnam, assisting uh, especially the people with disadvantages. Thank you very much. Uh, let's just go over here, then we'll come back here. You have someone there? Keep it fair. Uh, I'm John McAuliffe. That really was not planned. <laughs> it was totally coincidental and the organization became the fund for reconciliation and development because so we began to work on Cuba as well. Um, I, I wanted to pick up a stream of my memory that in the first discussions uh, there was a reference of the U.S. promising to provide data about Vietnamese MIAs. And then that seemed to fall apart because the software where all the data was contained was no longer readable, uh, even in the Pentagon. Did that information that the US had about where there had been mass burial grounds of Vietnamese in the South ever get produced? Has there been, from the Vietnamese perspective, sufficient support for the 10, what, 100 times larger problem of Vietnamese missing in action? Oh, I, can, I can't speak at length on that, but uh, I think one of the first uh, gestures in that regard, uh, Dr. Lou Stern, who is in the DOD staff, arranged to have the uh, what we call the CDEC files, uh, the Combined Documents Exploitation Center that operated in uh, Saigon during the war. All captured documents, documents captured on the battlefield, went to CDEC for exploitation. And those documents that were considered of intelligence value were recorded on uh, actually 35 millimeter film stock. And I think there was 140 some reels, large reels of that were ev evacuated to the U.S. in 1973. Well, Lou had those records copied uh, on microfiche and were transferred to the Vietnamese while I was there. I, I believe it happened in, I th I, my memory's not clear on this, I think it was 1992, but it was about that time frame. Uh, now, I had personal knowledge that within that group of documents uh, were many, many records uh, that were created by Vietnamese units that provided details about the dates of de the name, dates, home of record, uh, p personal information, dates of death, cause of death. Uh, there were large ros or long rosters of that. Uh, it would be uh, it would take quite a bit of time. Uh, but Vietnamese specialists could go through those documents and they could, because they're all written in Vietnamese, because they were prepared by Vietnamese uh, military uh, officers, usually the uh, Quan Li, the admin officer for a unit, would, carry, would comp compile these documents. And uh, so 
in that sense, but it would, re, it would a lot of pick and shovel work, but a Vietnamese specialist could go through those records and dig out uh, very useful information uh, that would be helpful on the accounting issue on the Vietnamese side. Uh, that's about the extent of my knowledge about the uh, the transfer of uh, information. I do understand, however, that there are uh, American veterans groups who have uh, uh, got together and are trying to help uh, Vietnamese veterans groups uh, accomplish those recovery missions. I would add a current day addendum to what Bob said in that a few years ago, Vietnam established an interagency committee to expand their ability to find, locate, and recover their missing. And to wit, the DPAA and the Department of Defense have offered the access to our archives as well as war to other wartime records. An anecdote that I think is very heartwarming is because of Vietnam's access to those archives, a couple of years ago they found a squadron commander from Binh Hoa Air Base who pointed out the location of a mass grave outside of the base's borders. And it ended up being over 100 Vietnamese so servicemen who were recovered and returned to their villages and their families. And something that if you, if you don't uh, read Vietnamese, you uh, may not be aware of, but uh, on, the, on the internet, the Vietnamese have established uh, quite a few websites that uh, uh, provide the opportunity for families to make inquiries uh, uh, about uh, the uh, uh, fate of their missing family members and locations where they might have died or been buried. And it's a very robust program that the Vietnamese have going on that. Uh, we had Hello? this gentleman here been very patient, uh, the yellow tie right there. Yeah, Ryan. Wayne Vallis, I'm on the International Advisory Council of the uh, Institute of Peace, and I was a political aide to Presidents Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Herbert Walker Bush. My question is to the, any of the Vietnamese guests or the ambassador, what do you think, and it's a slightly different question, what do you think are the main interests in common, defense and security interests between the United States and Vietnam? I, I think that uh, as a diplomat, I, I mean, we say we have a program of cooperation between our two countries, especially in humanitarian assistance, in maritime security, in peacekeeping, and in the medicines. These are, and also in many others, in training as well. So that has been put into an MOU and, and a, a plan of action for for the two countries, and I think that will, will be. But one common thing as diplomats that I must point out that we have common interests in uh, uh, working together for peace and prosperity in the region and in the world and between ourselves as well. So I think that uh, we have been working together in ASEAN, we have been working together bilaterally and globally as well in, in the UN. So peace and prosperity will be the common interests of ours. So in, 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 in security, it's the same thing. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. And Hello? I think we should go, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Sandy Dang, and I'm the former executive director of the Vietnam Education Foundation. So my question is that it's wonderful that we have a lot of Vietnam veterans who are really advocating for this effort in humanitarian and helping to build, rebuild Vietnam. One of my questions is that how can we continue to look forward? Because as you know, the war had affected a lot of many children and many children in Vietnam with a lot of disability as a result of the war. So how can we keep this effort going? I know that a lot of Vietnam veterans are getting to the age where you know, they are older now. So how can we keep this effort going for the next 15, 20 years in order to help Vietnam uh, and the children of Vietnam to recover from this, this, not recover, but how can help them to, for, to maximize their potential uh, when they have a lot of disability as a result of the war? Thank you. Anyone want to take that football? <laughs> <laughs> or is that a softball? I will, uh, 
Uh, the only thing, I, I'm no expert there, but I can only suggest that the, the uh, websites and such that the uh, that veterans are setting up, they're both here in America and in Vietnam, those are going, those are the um, genesis of the kind of information databases going forward that these ideas of how you take, take care of the children in the future and how you're going to deal with these kind of problems, I think that's one of the ways that that's going to happen. But like I said, I'm not an expert in that area, so I don't know what uh, what, uh, what uh, institutions out there are already working on that. Well, as a veteran, I, I'm 80 years old, so I'm not going to be able to do that much longer. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but uh, I, uh, I would explain it this way. I, I have... I traveled throughout the country for four years in the early 1990s. Everywhere I went, is, whether I was sitting at a street side fa stand or meeting with the, the head of a, a, a military region, wherever I went, I was received with genuine warmth and welcome by the Vietnamese people, whether they were farmers or they were diplomats. And, uh, I've never met an American tourist who's gone over there and did not have the same experience. So I think just the, the, uh, uh, the fact that more and more Americans are going to Vietnam and more and more Americans are, are seeing that warmth that, uh, with which they're received, I think that alone, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the warmth and generosity of the Vietnamese people towards Americans in America will actually keep this uh, going. All right, thank you. I, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panel members for their contributions to a greater understanding <laughs> of our bilateral relationship from the perspective of implementing mutually beneficial programs in the post-war period. I'd also like to thank you and members of the audience for your questions that help to further highlight the importance to both sides of this partnership. I'd now like to invite all of you to join us downstairs, upstairs, upstairs. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I am directionally challenged inside anything with walls. Uh, to join us for a short break uh, and be back here at 1050 where we will hear the Honorable Bonnie Glick, Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Thank you all for your kind cooperation.